Hello, everyone. I am Susan Kerpik. I was an attendee at SciCon 2023. You are looking at, I think, the last video on the playlist that I have completed. No one asked me to do these videos. I am not set up professionally to do these videos. I have no videography skills other than just just normal ones or making videos. What you are looking at is the panel discussion after the Sunday papers that was on October the 29th, 2023. We were at the Flamingo Hotel and there will be a SciCon 2024 at the Horseshoe, which is really close to the Flamingo. And that will be the last weekend of October. I do not know if Center for Inquiry, Skeptical Inquirer, will release videos of the Sunday papers. But nevertheless, I always record the Sunday papers because I think they're some of the best parts of the conference. I absolutely adore seeing these curated talks by people that may not be known to others in the community. And I just find them amazing. I will put in the description of this video a link to all the talks that were at the Sunday Papers presentation with the abstracts as well as with the bios of the different people who are giving talks. So if you haven't looked at the all the talks yet on the Sunday Papers, you will find them on this playlist. Also, you will find quick takes throughout the conference that I just happen to make um, nothing formal, nothing official, just out there. Some of the videos you will see that I've released are not available anywhere else because Psycon does not record everything. They just record the paper, to um, the talks that are done at the conference. So they will start releasing their videos starting in January, 2024. Um, please subscribe to their YouTube channel, which is, um, uh, Center for Inquiry, and <laughs> hit the alert bell so that you will get notifications. They'll release videos every three weeks or so, and then that will lead up to the next conference, which is in October of 2024. I hope you enjoy these videos. They are unedited. What you are watching is, I just, not the full, but very close to the full um, panel discussion after the talks on Sunday. I'm glad to be done with all these videos. Videos are not my thing necessarily, but I think it's important to, to allow people to be able to watch their own presentations and people who miss the presentations and for others to get a feel of what PsyCon really was all about and how amazing it is. The Sunday papers, there's usually so much information in these little combined, you know, these talks that are about 20 minutes long. It's all really condensed, very tightly condensed. And so it's nice to have the videos to be able to rewatch again and say, oh, that's right. I was going to look that up or, you know, I wanted to contact that person or that kind of thing. So I hope you guys enjoy. These are just, as I said, videos that I made. <laughs> Enjoy. Leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Like, share, you know the drill. ...of the monoculture. Um, they do believe that there are spirits that animate the world around them, but they do not have the conception culturally that those spirits are haunting anyone, right? And so I think that is the disconnect. I think that's the disconnect. Thank Excellent you. question. We have another question. Okay, have this is also a question for... Dr. Dyer, just about the methodology of the study. I'm curious if this, if first, was the class a, an elective or a requirement? And was your, were you collecting the data by taking, were you giving them multiple choice options? Because it occurs to me, could this language about its common sense, could it just be a proxy for, I don't want to have to do I was going to show you the wording because it is literally just one question. Um, gosh, sorry. It is a requirement, and students have to take it before they can take any content area classes in our major. So there, there is absolutely resistance. Could that be what this is? 
um, maybe, but I kind of think the reason they don't want to take the research methods class is actually because they think they don't need it. Um, but, but you're right, it could be just general resistance to research methods. Um, also for Dr. Diver, the students that you said, that you know the correlation between previous grades, uh, high grades, and the high grades in your class. Were you able to or um, get any insight as to the hours spent by those who did well? Oh, thanks for that question. And yeah, I've looked at this multiple times in my classes, time spent uh, by grades. And there is a, uh, let me think, it's a, uh, what do you call this shape? <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, this is the bell curve. So they're, they're low on time spent, their grades are low. If they're super high on, grade, on time spent, like the gal who spends 23 hours a week, she is deeply struggling and really, really has a hard time. So if they're not spending much time and if they're spending tons of time, they tend to be low performers. The people who do best are those six hours a week people. Yeah. Question from the back of the room. Uh, this is a kind of a dumb question for any or all of you, but for, for those of us who are outside academia, I wonder, uh, as you scale up your studies or do follow-up studies for the results that you've uncovered, and you know, I noticed you said in, in talking about the dark triad and the light triad, you want to scale up and so forth, and Katie may have other follow-on studies. How, how do you get funding for those things? And is, is funding available to, to do these larger studies? Um, it is available, but it's tough. Uh, in Canada, the Tri-Council Granting Agencies are the big ones, and those are very difficult to obtain funding from. Uh, at my institution, there are some grants, but they're relatively small. So one of the limitations that we have is that we need to do things for a very low price. So we did this all online. We used a convenient sample of our students. And we might use what's called a snowball technique next, and we'll post things on Reddit and Facebook and so on. And I've done that before, and that can work okay, and you can do that for very cheap. Uh, the problem is, if you want to go beyond that, use something like uh, just mechanical turf, which uh, people are paid to be research participants, that, that starts to get quite pricey. And that's a little bit outside of what we can do right now about some major granting. So it's tricky. It, it's tricky. Yeah. We have another and question. I want to say, Joe, that public education, you know, um, Theoretically, when public institutions hire researchers, some of that, they're, they're paying us to do research, right? So we only need the grants when we're doing huge scale or we have to pay our subjects to participate. So theoretically, this should be happening, but a lot of us have heavy, heavy teaching loads. And so use, doing research with students is a wonderful way to give them experience and to allow research to actually be done through a publicly funded institution. We have a question on this side. So I, I had a question about selfishness. So you had the light triad and the dark triad. You started with this, this premise. How much of that, so you found a really interesting correlation. Do you know if that's causal? And how would you check that? And where do you go for that? Um, causal is not, correl like correlation is not causal. So you cannot. <laughs> Like, can we go a bike for DJ? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, correlation does not equal causation. So um, it's it's correlated. There's a relationship, but it's not what causes it. So. <laughs> yeah, I think for us that that's a different question. It'd be interesting to understand that. But if we know that there is that correlation. Then we can do those follow-up studies and look at different strategies to combat misinformation. And if we can show that there are some strategies that are more effective than others, it's not so much that we're even worried about causation. What we're worried about is, again, helping people become better consumers of information. But it would be really interesting to find out what's driving what. But uh, we, that's what we weren't looking at yet, maybe in the future. Uh, yeah, mine's, mine's not so much as that question, but a hypothesis that the light triad is that they tend to be more trusting. <laughs> we think that might be the case too. I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think if you're more trusting to, I mean, with 
pseudoscience, um, people lie. You know, psychics lie. And if you're someone who's trusting, I know. I'm, I'm glad everyone's saying that. <laughs> but for the average person, if you see something in print or someone says something, we tend to be trusting. And people who score high in life try to be even more trusting. So I absolutely agree. So that's something we're going to try to figure out. Uh, actually, I don't remember the author now, but there is a paper on too much trust about uh, beliefs in, in pseudoscientific claims. And uh, I'm really worried as a scientist when we say follow the science or trust science, because it is a tricky word to use. It can lead to an excessive trust in whatever looks scientific. Uh, this is a question for Rob on the Havana syndrome. Um, is it con conclusively decided that, or, or that the eventual problem was caused by, by these crickets, or is that just one, one of many theories right now? Well, I, I wouldn't say the problem was caused by the crickets. It was a misidentification, basically. Like people were looking for a, a reason that they had whatever element it was, and then they noticed sounds. Interestingly, those sounds, this was a common two families, I believe, one was Acadia and Cricket, if I'm remembering that correctly, uh, in that area. And the, these diplomats had worked for decades in some cases just ignoring that sound. But as soon as somebody got ill and connected it, that became like K0. It's like, oh, now we have to listen to the sound and if you feel ill, even days afterwards, that's what caused it. So when you ask conclusively, well, you know, it, it, it's hard to prove a negative, right? The U.S. government intelligence agencies got together. They looked through all of the data, and I was very happy when they finally did publicly announce that there's no real evidence that we were attacked by anyone. Okay. And so, so the identification of the sound, it is astonishing that nobody, like presumably the locals live with this all the time, like the embassy cleaning staff Absolutely. Would, say, would just say, well, it's just the crickets. Like, how, how is it possible for it to generate so much um, uh, post hoc or no hoc trouble? Uh, <laughs> nobody. This has happens, anything. therefore, this happens. That, that's as simple as I can explain it. They were looking for a cause and they were caught, recalled something, and then they put those two things together. And it was a year and a half before the sound was identified as a reference. The US government said, oh, it's tech, it's some sci fi weaponry. They didn't say sci fi the credits on the side of it was, that we can't understand. So please, tech people, analyze the spectrums here and tell us what it is. And there were reports that came out, this must be multiple weaponry doing this kind of crap, and that was crickets. It just keeps coming down to correlation is not causation, isn't it? Right? Uh, let's take one more question uh, and finalize this wonderful session. Uh, this is regarding the Winchester house. <laughs> uh, I'm here from the Bay Area, so that resonated uh, strongly with me. I've been on the tour many times. And, and I'm sure you've heard all that information. Heard all that information, soaked up all that bullshit all these years. <laughs> uh, so this is a breath of fresh air. Thank you. Uh, congratulations for winning the misinformation war on Wikipedia. But do you have any plans, after having spent a year and a half researching this, to uh, attempt to infiltrate the Citadel itself to get something into their uh, gift shop, uh, Scott and Peace, uh, to uh, organize uh, picket lines in front of it, uh, to, to, to impinge on their business model in any way. Are there any plans? Well, I have a dream. And my dream is to invite Mary Joy Kafo, who wrote the book that I used extensively for my research. And we would hold, like, book the room. They have function rooms at the house. Book a room and a tour, and have her come and be a keynote speaker, and, I, and invite as many people as we can. So that's sort of my dream. I don't know if we'll ever make it do, but I know Susan does have some things up her sleeve. So watch, you know, watch the very Bay Area skeptics newsletters, and we're planning something. We're, we're hoping to do something. Have a tour, have a talk. We want, we really do want. But I love your idea of leaving stuff in the book, like in the in the souvenir books. That would be really fun. I love that idea. Well, let's have a round of applause for the real skeptics and scholars. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time to come out. Send me a big piece.
and we see you next year. And if you're not 15 minutes of terror on stage, please contact me. We got it. We'll line you up. Thanks. Okay. Oh.